Blog Talk Radio. Well, hello and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio Show. I'm here in Minnesota, but it really doesn't matter on this uh, holiday weekend because it's gorgeous and I have a wonderful guest for you today. Naomi File with the Validation Program is with us, but before I pull Naomi into the show, I just want to explain to those of you that are new to our show a little bit about Alzheimer's Speaks and what we're about here. Basically, we believe in giving voice to those afflicted with memory loss and their care partners, empowering them to live purpose-filled lives. Our goal is to raise awareness, give hope, and share the real everyday life stories of living with dementia. Our hope is to teach people how to live with the disease, not as the disease. Our channel expert, Rick Phelps, who has early onset may join us today. I'm never quite sure if Rick's going to be able to pop in or not. But Rick is the founder of Memory People on Facebook. Again, that is a great resource group. It's closed, so you have to be invited in. But you can just put in in the search bar on Facebook, Memory People, and ask to join. It's a true um, community of people with early memory loss, their care partners, business professionals and advocates that just support one another through the process. It is it is about building community and unity. There really isn't any pitching or sales that happens. Um, it's a great place to check out. So if you haven't done that, I highly encourage you to do that. I would also ask that if you enjoy the show today, we would love you to join our collaborative effort in shifting our care culture. Um, In today's world, we seem to look at caregiving as a crisis situation, and we really want to make that one of comfort and support. And to do that, it's all about sharing knowledge and insights and passions, and so we encourage you to join our mission. So if you like the show, if you wouldn't mind liking us on Facebook, um, emailing us to your friends, feel free to go ahead and embed the um, show into a newsletter you might have. Again, it's all about sharing the insights. If while we're live you have a question, you can either use the chat box or you can call in to make a question uh, or a comment, and that number is 714-364-4757. Again, that's 714-364-4757. So with no further ado, I want to introduce Naomi File. Naomi is the developer of the validation program. She was born in Munich in 1932, and she grew up in a home for the aged in Cleveland, Ohio, where her father was the administrator and her mother was the head of social services. After graduating with her master's degree in social work from Columbia University in New York, she began working with the elderly. Between 1963 and 1980, Naomi developed the validation program as a response to her dissatisfaction with traditional methods of working with the elderly population who were severely disoriented. In 1982, she published her first book, Validation, the File Method, which is revised in 1992. Then her second book, The Validation Breakthrough, was published in 1993, and again, it was updated and revised in 2002, and it's now in its second revision. Naomi and her husband have made many films and videos about aging and validation, and a number of these films have won awards. Naomi is the executive director of the Validation Training Institute and an extremely popular um, speaker in North America and Europe. Personally, I would call her outstanding. She has made a, a big, big impact in my life. In 1989, she toured Europe three times, or since 1989, she has toured in Europe three times a year, offering workshops and validation to um, Germany, the Netherlands, Scandinavia, France, and Belgium, Italy, Great Britain, and Austria. Her books have been translated into French, Dutch, German, Italian, Finnish, Danish, Swedish, Spanish, and Japanese. 
Um, I am, again, so thrilled to have her with us. This May, um, she is going to be celebrating her 80th birthday. I hope she doesn't mind me saying that, but it's kind of public knowledge. And she's actually coming here to Minnesota in Egan on May 4th, and she's going to be doing a workshop and having a a celebration and gala um, for all of the work that she has done. Um, Plus, there's going to be a meeting of the North America Validation Association, which I will tell you about a little bit later um, in the program. So, like I said, I am so honored to have you with us, Naomi. How are you doing today? Okay, thank you. I'm here in Chicago and uh, visiting my daughter for the holidays, and I'm just fine. Thank you. Well, good, good. I have a few questions for you um, because I really want to uh, let people know the work you're doing. You are as, as popular as you are. I'm still shocked when I find that some people don't know about you because your work is so powerful and it's so beautiful and um, your delivery tactics are are just really quite simple to implement in terms of changing mindsets. And so I want to help um, help you raise awareness of the work that you're doing. So can you tell us first of all why did you decide to feel um, why did you decide um, th- that you felt that there was a need for a new way? What made you even go down this path? Well, when I started in 1963, uh, hardly anyone knew that. I don't think the word gerontology was even known. So it wasn't a decision. Um, I grew up in a home, you know, where I think, as you said, where uh, in the Montefiore home as a little girl. And um, I knew the people. They were my friends. They lived across the hall from me. And I didn't have too many friends as a little girl, so uh, the old people were my friends, and um, many of them were disoriented. And uh, it was a very natural thing for me. I didn't think it was strange. So when I um, came back to Cleveland, I went away to school in 1963 um, and started working. I tried the methods that I had uh, learned first. In, I, I majored in, in, in social work school in, in what they call psychiatric group work, where you work with small groups. And that's what I did when I came back into the same home at Montefiore. I started small groups, but with the people who were then called senile dementia. Today, most of these people would be called Alzheimer dementia. And um, when I started, I tried, I, uh, my background was first behaviorism and then Freud, which was what the School of Social Work was really teaching. So I tried to get people to have insight, you know, to express their feelings and then figure out why they felt the way they did so they could change. And this did not work. And... Um, uh, for example, one of uh, one of the men that I worked with in 1963, and he was in his 80s at that time, said that the administrator, that was my father, was castrating him in the attic. And um, I tried very hard for like almost uh, uh, 10 years, in 63 to 73 is when he died, uh, to try to have him, you know, find out that that wasn't the case. But the more I tried, the the angrier he got, and um, the less he talked. And finally, at the end, he didn't talk at all. And uh, he's just one example of the people that I worked with that I tried to change. And when uh, reality orientation came along, and that was in about 1968, um, and the head nurse there at Montefiore said everybody should use reality orientation, which means telling people you're here in this home and your parents are dead and 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 this is the date. And I tried that. And um, people, uh, and I knew the people really well. And, uh, for example, uh, one um, lady would say, I have to go see my mother. No, this was a lawyer, a very famous lawyer. He said, I have to see my mother. And I said, Mr. Bartlett, you're 90 years old. Your mother is no longer alive. And he said, oh, she certainly is. My mother is alive on a technicality. 
<laughs> and um, yeah. So I mean, that's just a, a few examples of um, I tried all kinds of techniques with this population, and I found in each case that listening to the person, there was always a reason why they did what they did that this was not um, a strange disease or anything, and I'm talking about very old people, not people in their 40s or 50s or early 60s. But, uh, for example, the man that said that my father was castrating him in the attic, that he, his father, I found out this after he died by, from his sister, that his father had punished him when he was a little boy and locked him up in the attic and for things he never even did. And he never said anything. He was meek and mild his whole life. And now in his old age, and it was my Freudian background that helped me realize this, he was using my father as a symbol, as a substitute for his father, because my father was the authority in this home, and he was getting his anger out against his father, which he should have done years and years ago but never did. So, and that the lady that said, there's a man in my room, I found out that she was abused when she was a little girl. So, and there are hundreds of cases like this where I found that there was always a reason when people uh, said, I have to go see my mother, that they had to tie up loose ends, or when one lady said she was still working, she was working for GE her whole life, and um, and she, and she, I asked her how old she was, and she said over 30. And I, I thought, what? Um, and this is a woman who, when she was, she couldn't, who had to work. And when she retired at age 65, she brought her typewriter into her house, and every morning at 9 o'clock, she would be typing for General Electric. Okay. And she had this, yeah, and that she would fall apart if she didn't. Sure. Um, if she wasn't working, and that there was a good reason. So this lady couldn't remember. I mean, she did have physical damage to her brain, but she also had psychological reasons for going back into the past. And I found out that, you know, that this was not just the brain that explains the behavior, but the way the person has lived. And so validation, is, you know, became a very holistic way of looking at a human being, that when you get very old and you can't roll with the punches of aging like this lady, you hold on. Um, the psychiatrist Eric Erickson he called it stagnation. He said that we have life struggles at every stage of life. Actually, Freud started, said this too, but Erickson developed it uh, from little kids to very old people. And if you don't face your life struggles at a certain age, they come back later. And so when you get to be 65 and you have to retire, the struggle is um, you have to generate new activity. If your husband dies, you volunteer. If you can't work, you find, you know, uh, or you, if your husband dies, you find another relationship. Or if you can't work, you would volunteer. So, but this woman could never do that. She hang, she had to be a secretary and a bookkeeper for General Electric. And when she came into the home, uh, she couldn't bring her underwood typewriter, but she brought her purse, which was her filing cabinet. And she would be filing away, and she was very happy, holding on to something that was gone, but she had to do it. It was her only way of coping with losses. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and it, it's all, it, again, it gets back to she felt purposeful, you know, and that still yeah. her. Yeah, she had her sense of identity. Exactly. So can you um, can you explain in a little bit more detail how the validation program is different from a lot of other methods that are out there? And, and maybe, you know, if you want to highlight a couple of different methods, even just being kind of our, our general medical model versus the validation program? Well, when somebody yells and says, I have to see my mother, um, I guess uh, if you were in a hospital and you did that a lot, or I have to go home, I have to feed my children, and you're 90 years old, I think you would probably be given a tranquilizer to calm you down. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main goal is to calm people down. Uh, if you were in a in a nursing home or an assisted care facility, they would use a technique called diversion or redirection. If you said, I have to see my mother, um, oh, and also they would use a technique called the therapeutic lie. They might say, well, your mother's right around the corner. She'll be right back. 
So just sit down, and we're going to, uh, you see, we have this wonderful music we're going to play, and you love this music. So redirecting the person to another activity so that they don't think about uh, their mother or, you know, whatever it was, or their children or whatever it was that made them um, unhappy or anxious. Um, and, of course, there's reality orientation, redirection, I think, as I just said, and medication. I think these are the main the main um, methods that are used today, M- mm-hmm. mostly redirection, I think. Yep, I think redirection and the therapeutic lie are still, still right. used a lot out there. Can you tell us how how is your program different? On, um, and let's look at the therapeutic lie and the redirection. How is your okay. program different? Well, if if I if uh, someone says I have to see my mother, um, instead of redirecting them, you you know that there's a reason why this old lady has to see her mother or, or this man. Mm-hmm. And the reasons may be that there's unresolved issues. Um, maybe the old woman, when she was little, maybe her mother hurt her. And she never mm-hmm. talked to her mother. Um, or maybe um, she couldn't be alone. She had to have her mother. She never cut the cord as a teenager. So um, I mean, she has to tie up loose ends, and uh, she never had an intimate com- communication with her with her mother. And we all need to tell our parents how we feel. This is our task as an adult, mm-hmm. and she never did that. So the, the validation worker would help her, and also the validation worker would know that we all have a mind's eye. Uh, 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 Wilder Penfield was a neurosurgeon in 1950 who discovered the mind's eye. And it's a certain area in the temporal lobe. It's like what helps you dream and color. And um, if you don't see very well from the outside world, the inside world becomes really clear. And that um, I would I know that this woman could see her mother using her mind's eye and that there was a reason. So you would ask, um, where is your mother now? And and the lady might say she's she, she's waiting for me. I have to see her right now. She needs me. Um, what do you have to tell your mother? And you pick up the feelings of the woman. Um, and if she's walking, you mirror her tempo. What your your goal is to get into the world of the old person, and feel the way the person feels, and help the person say what they need to say. And then when the old person says, well, my mother is really sick and, and I, 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 she's all alone and she needs me, and you would pick up, your mother really needs you, and what do you want to tell her right now? I have to tell her, Mom, I love you, Mother. And the old lady cries, and uh, the validation worker listens as the old woman cries, knowing that crying is healing. You don't try to re-divert a person. Uh, distract them. You help them express whatever feelings they have. And if you do that, almost always the old person, once they finish crying and talking to their parent and saying what they need to say, they will say to you, my mother is with the dear Lord. She's gone. The person always knew that their mother was dead. But a few minutes before, their mother was alive. But once their feelings were expressed and validated, really listened to, whew, the person felt better. So and it, um, we have films of this, of people saying, I have to see my mother, and then expressing their feelings, and two minutes later, what do you mean, one lady says, um, my mother's dead. Of course she's dead to have a kid like me still alive. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is, um, and your story just kind of um, emphasizes this again for me, that really a person with dementia isn't all that different from the rest of us. They they might process things different, but the same thing is true for all of us. We have to feel our emotions and process them to be able to get to the other side and to kind of see the light when we're upset, when we're depressed, when, you know, whatever it is. I mean, we have to be able to embrace those those moments because stashing them, you know, just does damage and causes more frustration and angst and that was a perfect example of helping them express that emotion and get through it and be able to come to a, a peaceful place again. And so thank you very much for, for sharing that story. 
Can you and what tell also us? happens is after you after people do that, they don't see their their mother as often. You know, mm-hmm. in other words, the behavior lessens. Yep, because because the need has been filled. That's and, right. Uh, yep, yep. Great, great point. Can you tell us how validation is not, um, and you, you kind of went with this, not agreeing with the other person? Because sometimes I know people will say, well, it's you're just kind of agreeing with where they're at. Um, yeah, it's absolutely not agreeing because if I if I say there's a man under my bed, if an old person says there's a man under the bed, and you say, oh, what a nice man. Hi, this is Suzanne Newman, host of the Answers for Elders podcast and radio show. We are the North Star that guides you through the complicated journey of senior care with trusted experts in money, law, living solutions, and more. So join us on this station, your favorite podcast channel, or just go to AnswersForElders.com. Meet the Way Showers who will help your journey go a lot easier.